So if you have any question, please type your question in the Zoom chat or just send a private message to me or to Song Yang. Uh, so Professor Fletius, so you take the control now. And let's welcome Professor Kiha Fletius again. Yeah. Uh, so I will stop sharing and uh so perfect okay hard can you okay you hear me yeah 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 okay yes wonderful okay so i just have to make sure that everything is set up um let's put in a pointer and off we go so i'll talk about understanding modulation to mitigate doubly dispersive channels about OTFS and alternatives, because I think, uh, let's put it this way, maybe many of you know this, but I will try to convey some really important piece of information for many people that have been looking and working on OTFS, and because we have to put it into perspective. Um, as you know, I've been talking about this wireless roadmap for many years. And uh, this has nothing to do with OTFS. This is just about data rates that increase 10x every five years or 100x from generation to generation, from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G. And that means starting somewhat sooner or later, the red arrow hits the terabit per second. That means that would be if we have six and a half G. So within the era of 6G, we're going to go from maybe 100 gigabit per second to a terabit per second. There's a little bit of a challenge that I've been addressing in recent talks, which is that we're reaching actually an energy wall. And we have a big issue there. And uh, modulation schemes like OTFS are one of the reasons why we do that. Or if the M alone is already a problem, but OTFS even more. And I will not address that in this talk. We just assume the world is good and everything is the red arrow as is. But I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we really truly have an energy problem. And the more we do with our waveform, and I can explain that in some further slides, I will mention that the more we have this kind of an issue. So. That's why I think it's important to keep that in the back of the mind. So not that one believes that the next modulation is one modulation that can fix all. If we were to do that, then we would burn the planet's Earth um, energy. So the naive way is certainly not the right thing. But now let's forget about it because there are certain areas and certain properties under which, uh, and certain circumstances under which this is really possible. So thank you all for joining. And it's an honor for me to address you all in this community when I talk about it. So obviously, if we have fading, we have variations in time. And uh, we have fast fading that goes up and down like that. Now we have slow fading called shadowing that also is there. So we have, in a typical way of looking at fading, we have up states and we have outage states and the up states, depending upon how our SNR is and how big it is from the fading margin, we can see some data rate throughput, whereas in those red valleys, we don't see much in time. And the same thing holds not only in time, but pretty much the same kind of um, This will stop other things. Everything's okay? I hope so. I'm getting some weird messages up here. Um, Is everything uh, okay? Yeah, it's okay. fine. Thank you. So um, what is true in time is also true in frequency. So if we look at this kind of a system uh, where we basically have here the time, and here we have the frequency. This is a measured channel measured here at TU Dresden. And as you can see, we're going from minus 60 to 50 megahertz, so the 100 megahertz wide channel capture. And over quite a few seconds, over 20 seconds in time, we see a lot of variability in frequency and variability in time. 
And uh, this is just the selectivity part. But this is not the dispersion. This is just the selectivity part. That this also comes hand in hand with the dispersion is something that I'll address. But just for us to understand, this is not the reason why we would talk about a doubly dispersive channel. This is just a time frequency selective channel. If we have a time frequency dependent channel, as I say, it is not necessarily doubly dispersive. So what would a doubly dispersive channel be? So if we take our coherence bandwidth, our coherence time, our Doppler spread and our delay spread. So sort of, I call them always the four important parameters that define a channel or that characterize a channel. Um, then there's one parameter missing, which is our symbol period. And uh, so our symbol period is capital T, and it could be, for example, n times a sample period. We could capture multiple samples in one symbol. So that's why this doesn't mean that our sample that we're sampling a symbol frequency or that we're sampling at twice the symbol frequency, but we're sampling maybe at something else. And why would we do that? Because, for example, we're using OFTM. Um, now, a doubly dispersive channel is the special case where our coherence time is equal or smaller than the symbol period so that the channel actually changes within the symbol itself significantly enough for us to have to take care of. But that typically, every channel that we look at, this still means that our coherence time is much larger than the sample time. So we're sampling faster, we're having capturing multiple samples per coherence time interval, or within the time of, that is defined by the coherence time, but our coherence time is equal, nearly equal, or smaller than the symbol period. Because, for example, we may take an OFDM symbol and we have 100,000 subcarriers, so our n times t sample would be 100,000 100, samples, and that means the symbol period could be very long. The second thing that we have to look at is the same thing in frequency. So that our Doppler spread, BD, is larger than one over T. Now, why is it one over T? If you think of it this way, one over T would be, for example, the subcarrier spacing of an OFDM symbol, and N would be the number of OFDM carriers not taking into account the psychic prefix, of course, but I mean, just take that. Then we basically say that one subcarrier is not orthogonal to its neighbor anymore, but it leaks into the neighbor. And then we talk about a Doppler spread that is in the order of or greater than one over the symbol period, which would be the subcarrier space. Yes, but again, obviously, the Doppler spread is much smaller normally than the total bandwidth of our symbol, because otherwise, if it were much larger than the bandwidth of our symbol, and we were sent transmitting, let's say, at a 200 kilohertz bandwidth symbol, and we had a Doppler spread of a megahertz, then we would actually start capturing and uh, occupying far more bandwidth than possibly legally allowed, and this obviously is not the case. So we're looking at cases here always where the Doppler spread is smaller than the bandwidth of the symbol, uh, of, of our channel, meaning smaller than one over T sample, but we are leaking into our neighboring, spreading beyond the subcarrier. Neighboring, leaking into our neighboring subcarriers. Um, if we then look at this, then we have to understand there's a frame and a waveform design. In the frame design, we normally have like a pilot period, which could be like in time or in frequency separated, could be also sprinkled in. Here it's just drawn as a block. And then we have data. Uh, if we have pilot and data in the same domain, which also is the case, then you sort of have the sum of sum and pilot. 
we have this kind of proposals where we use, for example, OFDM and have some multi care spread spectrum or other kind of um, or a chirp pilot sitting on top of our OFDM symbol. So we could have orthogonal in time, orthogonal in frequency, or spread beyond. This orthogonal in time, of course, doesn't hold because of the delay spread leaks in here, and orthogonal in frequency doesn't hold because the uh, Doppler spread would leak into the neighboring um, parts of the signal, but this is a different story. Now, what we're really worried about here is not pilots, but we're looking at data symbols. So in data symbols, then, we want to do look at our waveform. And our two basic ways, classic ways of doing things is single carrier and OFDM. So in OFDM, we basically slice up our time in multiple frequency bins. And in single carrier, we slice our, uh, we slice up our, not our time, sorry, our frequency in multiple frequency bins. And in single carrier, we slice up our time in multiple time bins. And um, so that means if I have a frequency dispersive plus frequency selective channel, I would see some interference happening here between these subtiers. If it's just frequency, frequency selective, then obviously I have only selectivity here. But then the yellow carrier subtier might have a better challenge channel than the green subtier. Same thing here in time. If I look at the time um, variability of the channel, then the yellow subtier or this yellow symbol in time possibly could see a better channel than the red symbol in time. So this is basically what we have to look at. And this now we have to think of mapping into this deep frequency time selective channel that is also frequency time dispersive. So if we look at FD meaning frequency domain equalization, yes, what we do normal, normally is we take our subcarriers, we split them up, and we have a certain bunch of subcarriers, and we have some cyclic prefix in frequency. And then subcarriers and cyclic prefix in frequency, such that we can make a circular equalization over these kind of subblocks. And then we can actually equalize in frequency. The same way as we do it with a cyclic prefix in time with a delay spread, we could do it here with a buffer spread. And therefore, we basically have to look at that. If we now want to mitigate selective channels with symbol spreading waveforms. This is um, something which is also an important piece of knowledge that everybody has to understand, that there's the basics of a Rayleigh fading channel. If we have like a single antenna diversity one Rayleigh fading channel, could be also be multiple antenna, but it's a diversity one rating fading channel. As then a bit error rate goes down by 10x if we increase our SNR by 10 dB, meaning by 10x. So I have this one over x dependency between bit error rate and signal to noise ratio. And uh, on the log scale, this looks like a linear, on a log log scale, this is a linear line. Now, if we assume that I then am now sitting here at this spot where this pointer is pointing at, right in the middle, and I'm transmitting at this power level, then I have a bit array at the middle of this triangle. If I now were to transmit half the time at this SNR and half the time at that SNR, then I would have the added bit error rate, half the time I would have this bit error rate and half the time I would have this bit error rate. So now the question is, assume I split my time such that during epsilon amount of time, epsilon between zero and one, obviously a number, uh, the power is reduced by one of a row, meaning I have an SNR smaller, I'm sitting somewhere here. And one minus epsilon of the time, I have them transmitting at an SNR higher. And I want to make sure that the average transmit power 
remains to be identical. So my average transmit power is basically epsilon times I'm transmitting at P divided by rho, and one minus epsilon I'm, I'm transmitting at rho times P. And if I do the simple math of this, then, and say what would then, and this is the same thing as my power P. So that means like if I'm transmitting at twice the SNR, half the time, then I have nothing left for this year because twice the SNR, twice the power, half the time means I'm already eating up my whole power budget that I started out with. So the question therefore is, this does not work. I have to transmit less than half the time, but twice the power, so that I still have something left for the half power kind of period. And if I look at that, I have this very simple equation. That means my bit error rate now becomes this kind of an equation. I have a bit error rate nu that I have when I do this split, and I can basically, with this equation, I can, I can uh, uh, write epsilon as a function of rho, and then I can put that into this, and then I get this result, uh, that my bit error rate nu is the bit error rate of the P, old p average times a number that is always greater than one, except for the very simple case, rho equal one. And in rho equal one, epsilon is one and one minus epsilon uh, is zero or vice versa, doesn't really matter. So that means if I have any other assumption, meaning that I'm not transmitting the whole time at this power, but I'm transmitting ping pong in between two different power levels, I always get an impairment on my bit error rate. This is the fact of, due to the fact that I have this one over X in the log log scale, there's this linear dependence. That means what, if I were to take an AWGN channel, running at this red dot and I then have an or I have a Rayleigh channel and I can keep it constant in time or constant in frequency and I'm transmitting then that's fine but as soon as I start wiggling and I remain to have the average SNR to be identical to my previous SNR, I get a hit on the bit array. And this is really important on it. Um, and if you then look at this, this means we have basically here, the situation, whatever you play around with, this is the metric, by the way, if you put in row equal two, you have one plus eight, uh, divided by uh, two plus six, meaning eight. And if you take rho as a half, then you get exactly the same portion. So this is totally symmetric. So what does that entail for us in our domain? That means if we have a frequency selective channel, It will always perform, and it has an average SNR, an average power level of whatever all, it will always get a hit in terms of uncounted bit error rate versus a frequency flat channel. That means if I then use OFDM, the hit I get at these low SNR subcarriers I cannot make up for with the high SNR subcarriers. This is due to this one over X function. Same thing holds in time. If I have a single carry system in time and it has frequency selectivity and it changes over time, a symbol that gets a hit cannot be made up for by a symbol that is doing well. 
this, what does that mean? And that's really important to understand. So if we take a channel capacity uh, and look at it, and we say, of course, our receiver is the H, this is the channel matrix, this is channel modulation matrix, this can be time, this can frequency, can be time frequency, whatever it is, uh, this is the channel matrix. Um, but now this is, of course, typically in time. We have a modulation matrix A in which we can basically map any data into time, into frequency, into time frequency, into OPFS, into or orthogonal chirp modulation, whatever else. You can always design this in this kind of a way that you have basically your channel receive symbol is nothing but the channel matrix times the modulation matrix times the data plus the noise vector. Um, then the channel capacity is very clear. This is, uh, and uh, if our modulation matrix is made up of um, K symbols in frequency, so if K bins in frequency and M bins in time, so thing we have a K times N time frequency bin, uh, M is in time and K in frequency, and, and capital N in this case then becomes a product of K times M. That's the total symbol duration. That was the n times t sample that we had before. Then our basically our capacity is given by this equation. That is clear, right? And here we have the correlation matrix of our data. Um, now, if we were to have this to be identity, then we get the nice Shannon capacity, like in an AWGN setting, and everything is fine. This means we would have a unitary modulation matrix. Everything is perfect. We get an identity out of it. An equal power and uncorrelated data symbols is sort of the assumption that we need to be able to have. However, what we know is that at, in case of coded modulation and QAM symbols, which are not Limit, unlimited, but it's a limited set, we cannot achieve this identity matrix. So that also means from this point of view, a waveform will always be impacted by, the, by this modulation matrix A, and therefore we see differences of different modulation schemes. Yes, and if we then look at the that's the uncoded case. In the coded case, it's a little more complicated. It's difficult to determine, that is clear. Um, the solution, however, is of course to do pre-coding in case we know the channel. And uh, if we then look at this, the solution for this waveform that was to be optimal and look at the upper bound that we've derived and shown in this paper, um, you can see that what comes out is what I mentioned before. On slide, when or what? Maybe? No, this. This one. Slide 12. Yes. So, what is clear from this basic understanding, it is clear that here, in this case, we do get a hit. That means the coded modulation capacity of different waveforms is different in this kind of time frequency selective and, uh, and spread systems. Um, if we then have a look at this, we can actually see here for n, that is k times m, as I mentioned before, for very small n, like n equal eight or n equal four, and j is the modulation index size, so I mean, this is uh, the modulation order. So two to the four would be 16 quam, two to the two would be QPSK. You can see very nicely that, yes, um, a single carrier system, as we can see here, um, is doing better than an OFDM symbol. Because in this example, we are more frequency selective than time selective. 
And because of that, the single carrier system outperforms the OFDM system. This depends upon which channel you look like. There's a power delay profile given here. That is exponential power delay profile. This is where this comes out. So you can play around with this. I could generate exactly the same example by changing the channel, flipping it in time and in frequency. And then obviously the OFDM system would outperform the single carrier system and vice versa. So, um, and here you see the same thing for a different symbol size. And why would the symbol size make such a capacity change? First of all, the modulation index is bigger. And we see also um, that uh, this basically lifts us then to the limit of two bits per second per hertz information rate, or bits, two bits per channel. This is, as a, this is not a, in a complicated setting. This is not with uh, high modulation orders, anything, just to give you the basic understanding. So now what we want to do is we want to generate something where all channels are equal. And um, so that means we want to generate a modulation matrix A that spreads data in frequency such that everyone sees the same channel. Then we don't run into this one over X problem. And so that means we can do that by what? By somehow not doing OFDM and keeping the symbol separate and only doing error correction coding over the subcarriers. That alone is not enough because that we, if we do that, we get the one over X hit. But every symbol should be the same SNR over frequency. And it should see the same SNR over time. So that means what do we need to do? If we have, for example, this kind of system assembles in frequency, and we have our cyclic prefix success in frequency for doing frequency uh, equalization of our Doppler spread, um, or this could only be also in time, then it will be for our delay spread equalization, the same kind of a system. What we need to do to get this is just, for example, add up these symbols into a sum here and add them up in a different way, orthogonal way, into a new sum here, and add them up in a third orthogonal way, in a new sum here, and add them up in a fourth orthogonal way. How could that be? We could take the FFT. And if we were to take the FFT, that's when we get OTFS. So it's all about understanding we need to spread data per sublock in frequency, and we need to spread data per sublock in time, make the symbol long enough in time so that we can go equalize over all time bumps. And we have to be make it long enough in frequency or add them up in frequency so that they're flat in frequency. And then we basically have that. So we need something that spreads in time and something that spreads in frequency. And this is what OTF does. It does an FFT in time and an FFT in frequency and then basically all these kind of blocks. And that is what we have. And so this is basically the, where the whole performance gain of OTFS comes from. So if we have these doubly dispersive channels that are frequency selective and time selective, and we want to build this kind of modulation matrix, we can, for example, in OFDM, um, we do no spreading in time, no spreading in frequency, um, in time, we do a little bit of spreading due to, in, in theory, we do a little bit of spreading in time due to the fact that we are using an FFT and that's why we have N samples uh, per symbol, but still not really. Then we basically have two identity matrix and that is what we have. If we have single carrier, we're actually looking at it that we're spreading in frequency, massively, totally. Every symbol is exactly all frequency components identically. So anything that we see in the terms of frequency selectivity is equalized this way. And in OTFS, 
we use a Fourier transform in frequency and in time over multiple OFTM symbols. And, uh, and this is where we then basically get this nice gate. So that is the important part to understand. So if we then look at this and say, what do we expect from this? And take, for example, your sub-channel models that really have this kind of delay spread and Doppler spread that makes this a, a doubly dispersive channel. Um, then we, uh, and, and we really want to have a look at this. So that means we have this kind of bumpy channel or we can also draw it over multiple time instances. Then we see it like this. Um, then we see that it changes and varies dramatically its frequency response over time. Um, then we can see this kind of simulation result where OFDM performs according to the blue line, single carrier picks up quite a bit because we have quite a bit of frequency selectivity and OTFS picks up another 0.8 dB due to the fact that we have the picking up here a little bit on the um, dispersion, dispersion um, also in the frequency domain. If we then do a power delay profile in the time domain and look at the spreading gain here, this is again another example. Here now these are channels. Here you see the x-axis is time. Um, and uh, we have different symbols. Uh, so we have here um, L equal four and L equal 16. Um, delay spread, and then we, if we look at this and with this uh, with our channel model, this was the L was in the channel model. Sorry, in the um, exponential power delay profile of the channel model. If we look at it then here in the time delay, again we see that OFDM is performing here, um, single carry is performing there, and OTFS gets the 0.8 dB performance improvement or a channel model with 16 tap delay spread, then we see that all the difference between single carrier and OTFS actually becomes a little less. So now the question is, if that is it, why do we use the FFT for OTFS in time and in frequency over multiple OFTM symbols why not just use a simple default Schrodinger transform? Well, Schrodinger transform has the nice um, that it only has plus minus ones. There is no sine and cosine in here. Uh, it's simple add and subtract. It can be done very simply in hardware. It is really nice. The complexity, that means, can be reduced um, by using basically, again, not only this, but what we also proposed is to do sparse spreading. Because in the end, if you look at it in, in terms of this kind of a channel, I don't really need to follow every time sample. Or if you look at this kind of channel, I don't need to follow every frequency sample. I just have to be sort of sampling once in a while. If I know my coherence bandwidth, I just have to pick it up once in a while in some nice interval, and, and then I can save possibly a lot of energy. So that's why what we proposed also is to say, if we have this kind of Walsh-Hadamor matrix, we can then also, and we don't have to build all this theory around um, this different domain that we're looking at, a warped domain in this time frequency domain that you look at in OTFS, which is actually just spreading in time and frequency with an FFT, um, then we can also do it this way. So then we can do time domain sparse spreading and frequency domain sparse spreading. And if we do that, then obviously we have a very simple solution that only adds and subtracts, normalizes and still, but adds and subtracts, and also not every time instant and not every frequency instant. 
Um, so that we have one data vector where you add and subtract uh, d0 and d4, and the next one would be d1 and d5, and d6 uh, and d, uh, uh, d2, etc. And if you do that, what you can see here with this very simple solution, you can achieve exactly OTFS performance. And this is basically what we're showing here. And no matter which channel you look at, whatever grammatic time frequency domain spread channel you make, this actually has the same performance as OTFS. You can always choose your parameters such that you have the same performance as OTFS. So there's no real reason for OTFS um, beyond the fact of capturing the spreading over time and spreading over frequency, making sure that every symbol sees exactly the same energy channel, a different channel, but the same energy level. So every symbol sees the same SNR. That is the whole idea behind it. But this we can achieve in a much simpler fashion. And if we achieve this in a simpler fashion, why does that also address partially our energy challenge? This is maybe also important to understand. Um, if we look at this here, we spread in data in per sublog in frequency and in time over multiple OFDM symbols with multiple OFDM subcarriers. Then we're doing a lot of operations. A lot of operations means the symbol plurality that comes out, which I later on have to detect, becomes bigger. That means I need an A to D converter with much, much higher resolution. That means automatically, and I'm not only adding, subtracting, but I'm multiplying with some uh, rational number with sine and cosines. So I really need many more A to D a much higher A to D resolution on the receiver side compared to an OFDM system. However, if I were to use uh, this kind of a waveform, I'm just adding and subtracting a couple symbols in time and frequency. And so, yes, it does increase also my A to D resolution on the receive side, but, but quite a few bits less than what I need for OTFS. So that's why you can achieve exactly the same performance with much reduced power consumption and complexity. So that's why this doesn't, this complexity analysis just looks at the multiplications and adds not on the quantization on the repeat side and already on the multiplications and adds. Obviously, there's a huge difference between selective Walsh Hadamar and OTFS. Um, you see that here, a huge difference. Q is just a subset of uh, N that we have. And uh, so this is much smaller. And um, that's why, plus we in addition have the advantage of having less power consumption than ATG converter. So that's why, what is the fact? We've learned spreading waveforms is really the way to improve the system robustness if you need to. Remember, this is only for channels that are not time frequency selective, but time frequency dispersive, really double, dis double dispersed channels. That's when I need it. However, this depends upon choosing our symbol length capital T, as I mentioned. So that means I, as an engineer, I'm always capable of choosing something that maybe not necessarily requires this. But let's assume, for whatever reason, I have come to the point that I really need to look at a time frequency um, spread channel, dispersive channel. Then this comes of always at the cost of a more complex receiver. That is clear, no matter what I do and a more power hungry receiver because of the additional resolution A to D quantization steps that I need. So understanding the performance complexity trade-off is really crucial. And um, if I do that, OTFS, yes, is a solution, but just one solution, and most likely not really the best solution. 
not from our understanding or let's say from my understanding point of view, because uh, that comes into play. Other aspects that I haven't touched is the encoder, decoder complexity, the equalization complexity that of course comes into play. Um, but I mean, also the equalization complexity is reduced. If I do the selective Walsh Hadamard, I only have to equalize on the selective part. Uh, so that is also an easier equalizer. And I, I have not addressed the MIMO challenge in this whole aspect, but there are also the subcarrier selectivity and time selectivity, of course, is always helpful to reduce the complexity. So that is basically what I wanted to convey. The basic understanding of the 1 over x dependency between bit error rate and signal to noise ratio that basically determines the need for spreading in time and spreading in frequencies in such a way that every symbol, quam symbol, sees the identical SNR. Then I maximize the capacity, then I minimize the bit error rate in the coded case not only the uncoded, but in the coded case. And if I do that, then I, however, have to look at choosing it in such a way that it minimizes the complexity and I can achieve the same performance with massively reduced complexity by just using selective wall shot. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, thank, thank you so you much. much. Hard. Yeah, thank you. So I think there are quite a few questions. So Sean, have you collect these questions? Uh, yes, of course. Okay. Uh, first, like I think this is a really wonderful talk, and uh, uh, I have received several questions that I hope that uh, Professor Fat was I will have some time to address. Um, so I noticed there is uh, there were people asking about. Um, for example, that OTFS using pre-coding that leads to a specific physical meaning for the channel. Uh, on the contrary, if we use watch Hadamard transform, well, we have a similar, I mean, or physical meaning for the channel. Yeah, so we don't have the same physical meaning because the idea is to look at it really in the terms of information theory. And information theory yes. tells us just have to equalize the SNR per symbol, make sure that every symbol sees the same SNR. And no, we don't have this physical meaning, but in the end, who cares? All we want to achieve is the top. It's the performance, yes. Yes, yes. we want to minimize the bit error rate. Yes, thank you. Um, there are also, um, I've also noticed that there are actually, other than the watch Hadamard transform, there are also, for example, uh, Asymptotic OF, OT, OFDM modulation and uh, a lot of like a conventional uh, multi carrier schemes that may also apply to the spreading signaling in the time frequency domain. Do you think that will also have the same or a similar uh, effect uh, for OTFS or in general the spreading uh, signaling? Yeah, so I mean, what I showed is we really have to look at this modulation matrix, right? We have frequency yes. bins and time bins. We have sort of this. K frequency bin times M time bins in terms of where we can place our symbols. And if we basically look at this kind of a matrix and our modulation matrix, in the end, if we use any kind of orthogonal transform to basically add up these symbols, such that everyone sees the same channel, or not the same channel, sorry, the same SNR. Every symbol sees exactly the same SNR. It doesn't really matter which orthogonal transform we use. We can, can use a DCT, we can use an FFT. If it's an FFT in time and in frequency, we get OTFS. If we use a Walsh Hadamard, Walsh -Hadamard then we get what, what we propose. But there's plenty other transforms. Yes, that's absolutely right. And so at this point in time, I don't know which one is best. Okay, <laughs> that's fair enough. Yes. Yes, I would not claim that the selective wall Hadamard is the best because maybe there's some other transform that really makes it much easier to equalize. I didn't touch that. That could be true. Yes, yes. Um, there are also questions people are asking. Um, if that's, that's the case, because we are using spreading uh, signaling at the time frequency domain, can channel coding do the same? That's the fun example thing. If, yes, yeah. that's the fun thing to understand. Channel coding cannot do the same. 
Okay. So if you look at it this way, if you look at the channel capacity, let's forget about all the say log one plus SNR. Right. And if we look at that, that means we have this nonlinear function. So to if we have the SNR, we more than double the bit error rate, or we more than half the channel capacity. And if we double the SNR, we don't double the channel capacity. So we have this nonlinear problem with the log in there. Um, and that basically is the similar thing as I showed you with the one over X with the rating arm. So it doesn't really matter what you look at. You always get this hit. So what we, if it's coded, if it's uncoded, we always get this hit. So that's why it's really too important to understand that what we really have to do to minimize the bit error rate in a coded setting is always to go for an equal SNR per input symbol. Okay. Thank you for your explanation. Mm. I think that's all the questions I have received so far. If there are any other further questions, uh, please just type in the <laughs> chat so I'll ask. How about you, Vijay? Do you have some questions? Uh, uh, I, I actually, I have seen some new questions. So okay, yeah, yeah. Have you seen? Uh, for uh, example, the, can WST be extended to the spatial domain? Yes, good question. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's easy to make, build a three-dimensional uh, Fourier transform and extend um, OTFS to the spatial domain. And that's easy to do that also in the wild karma. Yeah. And many other transforms. All these transforms are just, uh, can always be generalized to multiple dimensions. And that is, yes, that, but that is a very good question because that is exactly true. Um, now, if I were to assume that I have a, Frequency domain, we however know, uh, 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 MIMO domain, we however know that we maximize capacity by making sure that we use those modes or those eigenvalues and those eigenbeams um, yes. that have the highest capacity. So we have to use those and then over those different beams, then we have to do the spreading. Right, but we have to do water filling, so we shouldn't use beams that are below the water filling level. We should use the best beams, and amongst the best beams, yes, then you do exactly the same thing. Wall Chadamar, FFD, DCP, or whatever kind of orthogonal transform spreading you want to do. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I have received another question. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so there are people are asking uh, how to solve the problem of carrier orthogonality uh, destruction after okay. after frequency ex uh, extent. Sorry, so, uh, after the yeah. from the channel. Yeah, I, I understood it. So look <laughs> at it. Yeah, uh, very good question. So really, what you have to look at is this two-dimensional matrix. Yes. Yes. Okay, sub carriers. And then M or the M symbols tag behind each other. And what you do then is a cyclic prefix between the O of the M symbols, right. such that we can make sure that the delay spread does not disrupt one of them from the other. Right. And right. we can do the same thing in the frequency domain since we, to make a right. cyclic, we can put in a cyclic prefix in frequency subcarriers as well. And then we have the similar kind of situation. Right. Yes. Mm. There is a, there are also some general questions. For example, people are asking, is doubly dispersive channel really practical or really a common setting for future communications, including 5G or 6G? <laughs> oh, very nice question. I love it. <laughs> that's a good question. That's what I tried to address in this, with this slide. Yes. Um, yes. So if you look at this here, we don't have any channel where the Doppler spread is larger than the bandwidth of the channel. That makes no sense. 
-hmm. And we have no situation where the coherence time is shorter than the sample time. It's always greater than the sample time. So that means because we have that, we could, of course, change our T by changing our capital N such that one of these equations here turns into that. And that's into this kind of situation. And that means um, a very good question. That's a question I'm asking myself too. I have no answer at this point. <laughs> it, that's fair. Because, yeah. yeah, because if I were to design a modem, let's say for five, let's say seven gigahertz carrier frequency, and then I want to use for whatever reason, exactly the same modem at 140 gigahertz or 120 gigahertz, 6G millimeter wave, then obviously it can be that I just jump into the situation where I really have a double the dispersive channel. Yes. yes. Yeah. And fun yes. fact, the problem, the question we had before. So the cyclic prefix makes our channel circular in time. Right. And the frequency prefix would mean I took take the bottom subcarrier data symbol or the whole subcarrier symbol and copy it at the top, make it cyclic in frequency. And this way yes. I can basically then with this double L, and then I can do my typical that I've been doing right. all the time. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the explanation. Um, I, I think due to the time, um, due to funny. the time limit, maybe we can just take one, maybe yeah, there's one, one more question. <laughs> it's from uh, Hai Feng Wen. Uh, he was asking, can we optimize pre-coding sequences based on the information theory perspective? It's like a more like a research direction, a um, research direction in the future, I guess. Yeah, so if I had a doubly dispersive channel, right. that means it changes quite fast in time and, is, and has the dispersion in frequency. Um, that means in this case, pre-coding is nearly impossible because I will not get my pre-coded information back again. My channel has changed too much already. So the, I need the channel state information for pre-coding. So that's why um, these OTFS and similar kind of modulations make sense for doubly dispersive channels. And for that, those kind of channels, pre-coding is really tough. I see. Um, I'm not saying that you cannot do zero pre-coding. There possibly is a little bit of pre-coding because maybe the channel changes only slightly and that there's some slight feedback that has, still has some correlation with reality. Uh, there's certainly something that you can do there if you assume there's some correlation left, um, but it's much tougher. Now, in general, the question obviously is, uh, yes, if channels change slowly, either in time or in frequency, there's always a chance to do pre-coding. Right. And that is yes. obviously remains to be interesting to look into that. OK. Hey. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah. Um, I think it's a pretty wonderful speech. And <clears throat> I have learned uh, really a lot. And I, I, I have noticed that we have attracted around like uh, roughly 200 audience during this uh, presentation that means like uh, it's really good. So do you? Uh, do you I have just any wanted to say else? thank you. No, I just wanted to say thank you to all the listeners. <laughs> I hope they got the idea. I want to also thank yes. of course Roberto and Ahmad, especially Roberto, who's uh, basically spent almost his whole PhD topic just working on this. <laughs> and uh, uh, so many of these graphs and whatever were generated by Roberto Bumfin who is here listed as the second in the row. So, and he hopefully wow. is also logged in. So he's done a fantastic PhD thesis and is moving on to uh, Abu Dhabi for his postdoc period. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure. So if we have any time, so Gehard, I'm not sure. So actually there are some other questions. <laughs> okay. I still have three minutes and then I have to run into an exam. Uh, yeah, okay. Maybe the <laughs> Amit has a question that how about in a Leo sat satellite com communication system that the Doppler spread is quite large? Uh, 
uh, I'm confused by this question. Okay, so in a satellite system, the satellites are, the velocity is pretty high. Yeah. And uh, the that's why I get a pretty high Doppler shift if I have line of sight, right? Now, if I have a line of, if I have a non-line of sight situation in a satellite communication system, I still have the problem of the basic Doppler shift. The spread is actually the same on, as on ter, in the terrestrial domain because that domain, that the Doppler spread mainly depends upon the local um, reflective scenario. Think of it this way. If I'm driving away from the base station at 100 kilometers per hour, I'm at about a gigahertz carrier, I'm going to see about uh, 100 hertz Doppler shift. Right. If I, uh, a truck is coming towards me and I'm seeing a direct bounce off the truck, the truck is actually, the channel is reduced the, the two of us are traveling towards each other at 200 kilometers per hour, and the truck is traveling at 100 kilometers per hour towards the base station. So I see an additional Doppler, not minus 100 hertz, but plus 300 hertz. Right. So, but that depends just on my local situation. So the Doppler spread depends upon my local situation, less so on if the base station is on ground or has a, is zooming away itself uh, somewhere else. That just determines the total shift of the yeah. yeah, it is the truck and me driving away. It's not the satellite. Okay. Unless the satellite bounces, of course. Yeah, so often sent, satellite. <laughs> one of, I think so it's it's uh, it's four four PM in Germany. So thanks again for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, bye.